I want to welcome Agile XRM to the podcast. I've known the people at Agile XRM for the past 12 years. I've seen how their business process management tool can add massive value to complex organizational processes in sectors such as finance and government. If you have complex processes or a need for dialogues on the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, take a look at how this BPM tool can add value. You can find them at agilexrm.com or check out the show notes for more details. Welcome to the Power Platform Show. Thanks for joining me today. I hope today's guest inspires and educates you on the possibilities of the Microsoft Power Platform. Now, let's get on with the show. In this episode, we're going to be focusing on successfully growing uh, a center of enablement uh, within with the Power Platform. Today's guest is from Surrey, England, that lovely place I used to live at oh, some time ago. In fact, the guest that I'm interviewing today was one of my last interviews before I left England to move back to New Zealand. He's the group manager of the Global Power Platform practice at Avenard. He's an international speaker. Uh, he has done a lot of work over the years in the Power Platform, one of the originals getting into the space. You can find links to his bio uh, in the show notes for this episode. Actually, check out his latest blog posts around establishing uh, centers of enablement. Welcome to the show, Simon. Yay! Hi, Mark. Really good to be talking again. It's, it's so long since that original uh, session we yeah. did, isn't it? It's so exciting to look back on that. It's it's crazy how time has flown. It was episode, let me see here, episode 160 uh, that I did with you, and I just published episode 457 this morning. So um, there's, been, there's been a bit of a gap between there and there. Yeah. Oh, things have changed. They've changed a lot. Absolutely. Last time I spoke to you, you were working at GSK at the time. You're now obviously gone from, you, you know, that was customer side. You're now what we'd say partner side with Avenard. Give us a bit of an update. You've moved around a bit. Tell us a bit about food, family and fun and what that means to you and where you're placed at the moment. All the things that you do when you're not uh, writing blog posts or thinking about the power platform. Yeah. So so a lot's changed. I think, um, I think we worked out that it was maybe 2019 that we last spoke something like that so so a lot's happened in that time so as you said I was at GSK I was leading adoption and and helping lead establishing the the governance and guardrails for the platform there and like a load of big organizations they they were constantly going through some kind of restructuring and, and redundancy and and I managed to poke it off with a stick for a for a little while, but actually the time came where I wasn't really sure how much longer I had in in the power platform. There, I delivered a lot of what I set out to do. I'd put the guardrails in place. I'd designed the process around that. I'd grown grown this huge user community of four and a half thousand people across seventy plus countries, all levels of the organisation, and got some real senior buy in and, and recognition. And I was thinking, oh, well, what what comes next? I don't really know. And and one of these rounds of redundancies came up. I thought, actually, I think it's I think it's time. I I'd been there for sixteen years, but I thought, well, mm-hmm. I think it's time for a change. So so yeah, put put my feelers out, started to connect to to some of those wonderful people across the network, and and uh, spoke to Mister Huntingford. And uh, as a result of that that connection moved to Avenard and it's been nearly two years now that I've been here as um in August it'll be two wow. years so so that's one big change that's happened also moved home so I used to be in Cambridgeshire I'm now down in Surrey I'm I'm living with my girlfriend my partner Juliet her 14 year old son William we've got two dogs we've got a cat we've got about 15 chickens life's life's really good it's it's really wow. fun how much land do you, are you on? Not a lot, actually. But, but there's, we've got a, a pretty good sized garden, and there's a chicken run at the bottom where they can all kind of congregate and, and do their thing. Um, yeah, so every, every morning we're out collecting some eggs mm-hmm. and, and feeding them, watering them, and then uh, usually poached eggs for breakfast. You can't you can't get any better poached egg than a fresh wow. chicken. Yeah. 
I love that. It's one thing I haven't got to yet. I'm going to put chickens in. At the moment, I've got a massive wind issue in that, um, you know, I get wind straight off the ocean. And so I've got to put some wind protection in before I get chickens. I reckon they get blown to bits otherwise. Yeah, sounds wise. I, I wasn't sure if you meant dietary wind there. <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm I'm talking about the uh, you know, we get up we 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 get up to some like 90k wind straight off the ocean. So, uh yeah, it can get pretty intense at times. Um and the animals don't like it so much. I got two cats and they they they, they don't mind it. They can they can escape inside. So, anyhow, let's let's get on with what we want to talk about today, which is uh, successfully growing centers of enablement excellence um, I will uh, quite uh, happily use here as well being that um, we're starting to see a pivot in the market around not just making sure that you get the governance and the guardrails and things like that in place but also that you really enable people to do more um, with the technology and really as they say, uh, a, a rising tide floats all boats. It's like in this technology area, if everybody can learn to become digitally literate within the organization, everybody benefits, um, careers benefit from it, people's work benefits from it. And of course, we can come up with some crazy cool new ideas on how to make uh, business more streamlined and productive. Tell me on your journey, from 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 your first exposure to where you are now, how has your thinking changed around how do you scale the power platform inside an organization? So I think I think that's a really good question. So when when I started this journey, well, actually when I started, it was it was it was entirely accidental. Um, so I was part of a big digital transformation program. I was the IT lead on that. And one of the work streams that we had, mm-hmm. we we were looking at a solution where across this factory environment, at all levels of the organization, they had these daily meetings and they would use those meetings to look at metrics, make decisions and then take away actions. And then they would come back the next day and then they would they would give updates on those things. So we had a, a goal to digitalize mm-hmm. that process and, and Microsoft came in and um, and they said, oh, well, uh, we think that Power Platform is the right platform for you. The, we can put loads of different components, and some of them can be graphs, and some of them can be forms, and some of them can display data. So we we, we started off down that route with this, this team helping us develop something in the Power Platform. Now, it, it turned out to be a complete catastrophe, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> And and I think it, Power Platform was such a young technology at that time that that nobody quite understood the scale of what we were trying to deliver, and and actually it wasn't ready for what we were trying to do. However, the silver lining on that was that uh, actually we they brought in Laura Graham Brown to to help us on, on uh, mm-hmm. resolving some of these issues. And Laura is amazing. It's, she's uh, she's one of my best mates now. Also now working at Avenard as well. Um, and through that connection, she she really opened my eyes to what the Power Platform was and to the community that's wrapped around it. She was the one that first introduced me to, to folks like Keith Watling. So in those mm-hmm. very early days, we didn't really have any guardrails. We didn't have any governance on the platform. I was trying to steer people to do the right thing. But but I was also trying to encourage as many people to 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 get out there and as experiment as possible. It felt like it was this really exciting technology. Didn't quite know how to use it, where to use it, who to use it, uh, how they should go about learning it. But that that north star for me was trying to trying to enable people to do something that they couldn't do yesterday, or maybe that they couldn't even believe that they could do today. So so I th- I think that part has been a constant for me over the last four or five years. That's always been my goal. It's always been that people side. Now, what I've understood as my knowledge and experience has grown is how to then think about the governance that you wrap around it. How do I set up the platform to keep people safe, but actually give them that space to to go out there and experiment, go out there and innovate, go out there and make a difference and then grow their experience, grow the guardrails so that it flexes with them and enables the right things to be done by the right people at the right time, by the, in the right place. I like it. I like it. Tell me, tell me though, 
without having the governance, et cetera, that, that you talked about back in those days, was there any implications of that? Yeah, there there was. I caused a lot of chaos. <laughs> I must admit. So, <laughs> so we started with um, with about eight people in our little gang that came together, and we we met and shared what we'd learned, shared some of the problems that we'd had, some shared some of the successes, and we started to grow that group. And as I, as I said, we got up to four and a half thousand people by the time I left. Now, with no, well, it wasn't no governance, but but not. The level of governance that we needed there were connectors available mm-hmm. to us that maybe shouldn't have been the the key one probably being sql now at the time you you'll remember that it used to be a standard connector back in the day so we came up with this use case to help with a health and safety problem of logging near misses so if i saw something that might hurt somebody i took a photo i gave it a description i scored it i categorized it I might have identified some actions and then I would use the system to to keep me honest and close those actions out and then rescore what it had got to. So we thought SQL feels really good for that. There's no additional licensing cost. It's nice and scalable. We built a product team around it. And partway through rolling that out to multiple locations, we, we'd rolled it out to maybe... 5,000 users, 6,000 users by that stage, Microsoft changed the model. So so then it became this premium uh, license. It became yes. this huge financial risk for us as the, the enterprise agreement came to an end. So that, that, and coupled with encouraging thousands of people to start making apps, start making flows, meant that we had a hell of a lot of stuff in the default environment that needed yeah. migrating into somewhere a bit more controlled and and uh, and and safer so so mm. that, that <laughs> i left um july ish two years ago they've just got to the stage where all of the the chaos that i caused is now back in the box it's it's conforming to the environment strategy everything's nice and under control so they're they're in a really good place. Nice, nice. In 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 coming into accounts, you know, now that you're partner side and you come and you and you you know you might get onboarded to uh, a new customer in the enterprise space, and they they have not been doing anything around uh, governance. They've not doing anything around establishing a maker community. They're not been doing anything around that. You come in and let's say they've had E five license um you know for everybody on the network or even e3 and so you've got those seeded licenses of power automate power apps etc being deployed through the organization when when you take stock what's the what's the process that you go through in your mind to go okay let's understand the baseline of what we're dealing with and then i want to unpack your thought processes then how you move forward from that point so let's start with you're assessing a, a new account, a new customer for the first time. Um, what's the kind of process you go through? What's your thinking? Yeah, that's uh, that's that's a really common scenario. So, so since I've joined Avenard, I've been involved with, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 different customers, either looking at putting some guardrails in and center of excellence, or more recently, as you, as you described at the beginning, the market's starting to pivot. And now there's more about enablement and adoption. But those those COE conversations, they generally follow the same kind of themes. So question one is, well, have you got the COE starter kit installed? If you haven't, let's help you put it in. If you have, when did you last update it? Let's help you put the more more up-to-date version in so we get the, the full benefit of it. And and those Power BI reports are like the Bible for those kickoff meetings. So so yes. what we tend to do is to have a look at well what what's going on. Let's let's have a conversation around what's in place. What do we see from your 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 visuals? And let's see how what's the problem that we need to solve. And in a lot of cases, that problem is maybe not as extreme as I described uh, uh, in my old world, but there's often X number of environments that have been created because they may have or may not have turned off the ability for people to create those environments. There's always a number of apps, a number of flows. Occasionally there's some pages or PVAs or or whatever, but but usually there's there's something that needs addressing. Now, 
what we would often then do is to to start thinking well okay well what what how do we address that what do you want to achieve what what's the the levels of governance that we want to try and put in let's let's design what that future state needs to look like so the way that that i tend to have that conversation and i've been sharing out across avenard over the last couple of years is is the same kind of model that i designed and i put into place at, at gsk so what we wanted to do there was to have a world where Actually, if something's low risk and low complexity, it's quite simple. Maybe it's just building on top of a SharePoint list or, or mm-hmm. possibly Excel. Something like that, low risk, means we shouldn't be too worried about it. They're the types of problems mm-hmm. that people are already solving today. They're solving them in Excel. They're solving them in SharePoint. We, we, we don't need to be too concerned depending on how they're using that. Whereas if something is is super complicated or it's used by tens, hundreds of thousands of people across an organization, we need to treat those with a bit more respect. If you're starting to use those enterprise data systems, need to look after those. We need to make sure you're doing the right thing. So we need to look after that stuff with care. So we have that kind of conversation to describe what that spectrum of governance might look like and how we describe things across that spectrum. Then we can start to design. So, so once we've got those levels that we we've split that into, we can think, well, what what's the environment strategy that sits underneath that? So something at the real simple end. Perhaps I'm okay using default environment for something like that. Something that's more experimental, shared with two or three people, only using office connectors, something like that. I'm probably okay with default on that sort of thing, but if you're if you're sharing it with thousands of people and it's used multiple times per day, it's connected to something premium. We need to think about that. We need to probably adopt those IT best practices. Maybe have our environment strategy set up like we would do with our servers. So have a dev QA prod implement ALM processes. Have a support model wrapped around it, so we can help describe the environment strategy in that way and think about the the granularity of of controls or or complexity and how we manage it we can do the same with the the dlp policies and define what what would be made available at that low risk end how are we going to manage things at the higher risk end <clears throat> and then we can think about all of the other processes in exactly the same way are there some that sit across every solution in the same way are there some where we can be more lenient at one end and need to be more careful at, at the other end? And once we've gone through that design process, we can then start implementing that structure and then help with that migration process. So moving things out of the default environment into that new world, into that controlled world. But that that can take a hell of a long, a long time sometimes because if uh, if we think about a DLP policy, or imagine there was no DLP policy, so you've got all sorts of stuff in default to start with. By moving that app out, yeah, okay, if it's one app using that one connector, great, I can move that, and then I can remove it from a, a DLP policy on the default environment. Nobody else can touch it again then, unless yeah. I, I want them to. But if there's 20 apps using that connector, I've got to have 20 conversations. I've got to move all of those apps into the new world or decommission them before I can put that that control in place. So it can be really complicated. Yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. Play forward. What's so so once you've you've got that. Now it's interesting you said it can take a long time. When, and I know that this is relative my question, but are we talking months? Are we talking 3, 6, 9 months? to to get that kind of stabilized system in place where you've basically bedded down and go, you know what, the foundations are in now, now we can actually build um, from it. Um, how would you answer that? Yeah, it, re- it really does depend. But if we're talking hundreds of apps and flows, then we're probably yeah. talking kind of high number of weeks, medium to high number of weeks. If it's a real concerted effort to, to get into control, if we're talking thousands, single single level thousands, it's starting yeah. to get into the months. And and if there's lots of thousands, well then then you're probably talking a year plus, depending on the size of the the challenge. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Tell me about 
if you were looking at the maturity model of somebody that an organization that had deployed the power platform, and I'll just explain what I what I see, and then perhaps you can give your lens on it. So I see organizations that have you know made a commitment to the power platform, uh, and, and you know all their head architects are on board, they're involved, you know, and they see a strategy, a multi year strategy of moving forward with the technology. What happens then is that they go, okay, let's get the governance in place. They want to get all that kind of sorted out, bedded down. Um, especially you know consider these type of clients that not necessarily done much yet. Yes, they've got a few of those apps kicking around that people have built through self-discovery, you know, of those, um, you know, through the, 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 the licensing that they had, the seeded license. But then I see kind of a fork happen and I, and I want to validate if, if you're seeing the same thing. So the fork is this one, the company goes, you know what, we don't want makers or citizen developers doing it. You know, where, where are, we're a bank or where, um, you know, security is so important and, and we don't see the power platform as, as enterprise enough, right? And so I get these conversations. And then you get the other one, the fork then, the other side is, listen, we're going to set up teams of people and they're going to build apps or let's say solutions, because let's not just start, talk about apps, but solutions for the company on the power platform. But, you know, the business needs to come, bring their business case, et cetera, and we'll decide based on our, our backlog what gets built. And so I see these that kind of fork happen, and then you get other organizations that go, no, all in, let's, let's get the governance in place, but then we really want to enable the makers. But we also want this kind of, a factory software factory where you know literally thousands of solutions are built by a team of people that are not that are really a team of, of skill sets so we're talking about change man you know change or adoption uh folks in that team full product and 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 project management we're talking about you know business analysts architects developers the whole uh, you know, UI, UX uh, experts coming in and, and making part of that team. That's a kind of the landscape that I find myself in quite a bit. What what do you see and, and where do you see, you know, those kind of the paths of maturity um, on the power platform and the customers that you've worked with? Yeah, I, uh, I see something quite similar a lot of the time. Uh, so, when when an organization comes to us, now that we're talking to more folks about adoption, enablement, because they've got those guardrails in place, they've got that level of safety and security and confidence in the platform. Now they're looking to move forward. So I, what, I, what I've noticed is that often, so the, often the conversations we have will be from the citizen developer end, which is really interesting. Mm-hmm. So it tends to come, I think that licensing is still a, a complexity and a barrier to people. So so mm-hmm. certainly the organizations that I work with are generally tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people. So they're big, big organizations. So, so for them to jump in and decide to go all in on licensing across their organization, even if they got an amazing discount, they're still talking big investment to do it across their whole organization year on year. And that budget totally. hasn't hasn't been isolated at that point in time. They're not 100% sure on the value of the, the platform or the solutions that they're going to be able to build. So often that we'll start talking about the citizen developer end and use that as a mechanism to say, well, look, we've got these tools that that actually, there's all these stories out there. People are changing their processes, they're changing their lives and their mm-hmm. how, their, mm-hmm. how their careers are progressing. They're changing organizations with those tools. Let's start low risk, low cost, experimental, and, mm-hmm. and start helping identify, well, who are those folks that, that could start going on this journey? Let's use them to start experimenting with the platform and showing you what value means. And, and maybe we can talk a bit more about value in, in a minute through those lenses. Mm-hmm. And then once you once that starts to grow, those those folks, so you've got people coming in the, the bottom end with no experience all the time. So they're, they're solving those small problems. They're gaining that experience. 
But you've got mm-hmm. those folks at the top end as well who are really looking to push the boundaries. They're really excited by the platform. They want to do more. They want to do faster. They want to do more complex, solve bigger problems. And they're the folks that start to then hit across, hit up against this lack of premium licensing. So yeah. what I often then see is, is there's a bit of activation energy needed that if they've got no premium licenses initially, then they need they need some. They need to do some experiments. So they they decide maybe it's hundreds, maybe it's a couple of thousand, but they need some licenses to to go out there. And then they're very targeted about doing a discovery with those parts of the business where they think the biggest value will be, finding those use cases that fit nicely on the power platform. They're they're high value. At this stage, they're low risk. They want to to go out there and use the the premium licenses to explore whether that financial return, that financial value comes back. And that continues to grow for a period. But then you reach another period of activation energies that's needed to then decide, well, I've proven value. I know the capabilities of the platform. I can see where it would fit in my my strategy as a a capability I want to build and, and leverage across the IT organization especially. How do I then make a decision to to say, well, let's let's go all in. I've, I've got enough in my backlog, yeah. enough big use cases that I want to move forward and and go off down that fork and make sure that I've got licensing for the whole organization. Mm-hmm. The, the, those are the, the kind of three phases almost that I see. And sometimes they happen in parallel. Sometimes they happen from both ends. Sometimes they they go through those those. Uh, life cycle phases in that way. Every organization's a little bit different, but they they all seem to touch on those three areas. Mm. Do you find as getting that buy in, you know, and and that license story? Because yeah, it is frustrating when for me it's frustrating not working with premium. Um, <laughs> you, you know, because it, it just it it reduces the choices and 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 the thinking or and the complexity of what you can do, but. Do, where does executive stakeholder engagement come into the play in that for you? So for me, it's being able to show them value. Usually it's it's not something that's coming right from the top down as a strategic decision. Actually, there's a lot. Um, I, I was reading just before we call, spoke actually about, about product-led growth, and, and I realised... Um, that's essentially what what I've seen a lot of over the the last few things. So there's a lot of bottom up, put the tools in people's hands so that they can start demonstrating value early. They become stronger and stronger advocates, and they influence their leaders to show them what the the potential value is if they can unlock that licensing piece. So so there's a piece of I think around it's great if you can go in at the top level and they get the strategy, they get the vision, they're bought in. And then it all comes top down. But in my experience, that's not often how how these conversations tend to go. So being able to prove value at different levels of the organization in different ways and really getting the visibility at that top level of the organization is is a, a much easier way. It's a longer but but easier way to to then justify or or help influence that decision and show them where it fits. Yeah. Yeah. Switching to the to the other end of the conversation, then, and you, and I like that idea of putting the hand the tools in the hands of the people and and let them you know learn them, and then they are influence up. How do do you systematize that in any way? As in um, making sure, like, uh, uh, let's say a brand new fresh person inside an organization discovers. This this uh, this concept of of app making or automation and uh, wh- how do you take somebody from that level in a systematized way and take them to a level of being able to produce something that the organization can use? And if I was to relate this into Excel terms, I would say it would be somebody that you know has um, they know what Excel can do, and then they start learning about Excel formulas, right? And then they start going, "Hey, I can write macros," and then all of a sudden they've built an app for the company in Excel, and it's it's become you know mission critical. How do you how do you replicate that for the Power Platform? Taking people from wherever they are 
expertise wise to a level and a competence and a confidence level where they are really adding value to the organization yeah i i have got a system for that actually I, ah. I when i when i was back in gsk i i essentially well let, let's call it agile it, to be mm-hmm. to be um <laughs> to to be favorable but if i was being unfavorable i would say well i kind of made it up as i went along it was a very experimental right. approach i i saw patterns of things that seemed to work and i did more of those i tried some other things mm-hmm. and they might not have worked so i did less of them um, mm-hmm. what i what i did over that period of two or three years and then coming into avenard and thinking more from a systemic perspective and how do i how do I open those those doors to other organizations and help them follow the same path? I I, I distilled that down into a system systematic way that I can I can then have that conversation. I can open those doors. I can encourage people. So it's something that I've been I've been I, everything needs a bit of a cheesy name, doesn't it? So mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. I, I've I've been calling it the maker movement. And, gotcha. and essentially, it doesn't matter where somebody is on their capability level. Let's let's say that they're those folks who already know about the power platform. They're they're if we looked at our list of makers, they've found the platform by by accident, by happy accident. They've gone off. They've started experimenting. They've started building things. So so we need to understand those folks. If they've built multiple things. Well, there's some advocacy there. There's some there's some enthusiasm. There's some excitement. Let's let's just have conversations with them. Understand. Well, how did you find it? What what went well? What didn't go well? How did you learn it? Where did you get information from? What can we do to help you do even better? And using those kind of conversations, we can then start sharing that people with sharing that with other people. So if we start putting mm-hmm. that. Through, stories out and and start promoting the successes that these folks have had not not just in what they've been making but the approach that they've taken and how they've owned their own development how they've done something special they've been a bit brave they've solved some business problems if we can promote those those behaviors those qualities other people tend to follow so so I've been reading a, a book or well, a series of books recently about viral change and it's essentially about that it's about those ways that we work out in the real world, trying to bring them into the the uh, corporate environment. So, something like new restaurants opened just down the street. All my friends have been raving about it. Mark, you you told me about the amazing chicken that they had. It was the best chicken you've ever had. So mm-hmm. immediately, I'm I'm influenced. I want to go to that restaurant because everyone's raving about it. I'm probably going to choose the chicken because you've been such an advocate for it. Yeah. It's that kind of behavioral change and those kind of techniques that we can use to help people on that on that journey. So if we then expand that, so that's somebody at the beginning of their journey or early on. Mm-hmm, those next mm-hmm. people that come into the funnel, well, if they need a bit of help, let me connect them to those people who are a step or two up the ladder. They're not super technical, but they're further ahead. They can be that guiding hand that that shows people how they did it, how they learned, how they solved some of the problems. And we can keep extending it in that way. So by nurturing people, especially at that top level of capability, and keep stretching them, keep giving them access to to perhaps a little bit more than everybody else because they've proven themselves, they've proven their, their mindset, they've proven their safety, we can keep moving them up the ladder and bringing them along and then keep nurturing the tail of that as well to keep bringing people through the system and, and help people along that way. So that that's how we can use a community to help build all that capability as well as having some more structured systems in place as well. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I'd love to unpack this more, but I see that we're out of time. Um, Maybe uh, we'll do a round two, Simon, and uh, explore a bit more your thinking in this area. Sounds great. Yeah, definitely up for that. Hey, thanks for coming on the show. Hi, you're welcome. Great to speak to you, Mark. Hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 guy. If there's a guest you'd like to see on the show, please message me on LinkedIn. If you want to be a supporter of the show, please check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash NZ365Guy. Stay safe out there and shoot for the stars.